So this morning, uh, go ahead and, and turn your Bibles to John chapter 20 is where we're going to spend our time at this morning. And let me ask you a, a question, as I often do. Do you ever struggle with your identity when you, I mean, like, who are you really? Right? You know, who, who are you really? That we wear so many different hats. You know, you know, we get confused sometimes. And we have some people nowadays uh, in our culture with, uh, they struggle with gender identity. That's the, that's the latest thing. They don't know if they're a man or if they're a woman or if they're a woman or they're a man or it goes back and forth between what day it is or what week it is or what month it is. But that's not the, the, what I'm talking about this morning. That, that's a topic for another day for another sermon. I'm talking about those times where, where you seem to just lose yourself. Right? You just seem to lose yourself, and you just don't even know who you are anymore. You know what I'm talking about? That, that you just kind of get so busy in life, and you wear so many different hats and all these things, and you just kind of sit down one day, and you're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. You know, I, I don't even know if I'm coming or if I'm, if I'm going. Uh, for some of you, it's your marriage is what gives you identity, right? That's where you find your identity at. And listen, you know, we should celebrate being husbands and wives. That's a wonderful thing, but it must not be our primary form of identity. Right? It can't be. It, it can't be because what happens when your marriage begins to struggle or, or your spouse dies or, 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 heaven forbid, divorce occurs? Then what happens? Then who are you after that? What are you left with? You know, who are you then? Or for some of you, it's your career. Your career is what gives you identity. Right? And so it's wonderful to be known as an electrician or a state trooper or, or a, 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 a principal of a school or a pastor or whatever it is, but, but that cannot be our primary identity. It, it cannot be because when your work defines who you are, you become a slave to your work, right? That dictates everything about you, you know. So let me ask you this. I, I dealt with this with my dad, and some, a lot of you are retiring here. Uh, I asked him, I said, my dad retired twice. You know, the, the first time he retired and went back to work, I was like, what are you doing? I said, why, why are, you, are, are you trying to achieve a certain level of financial s- stability or security, whatever that means? Or, or, I mean, why are you still working? You know, you, you've already retired once. Why are you doing this? And he says, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. That, that his, his work defined him, that, that he had been a supervisor and worked for the, the oil company for so long that he had lost himself. Like, he didn't even know what to do. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm going to do when I'm retired because that's, that's so much of who I am, I don't know how to function. Right, and so uh, some of you, your 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 skills or your talents are, are what give you identity, and, and it's great to be known, uh, especially I'm thinking of our young people, our students, to be the smartest, to to be the best athlete, or to be the most talented musician, or whatever it might be. But as you you know get older, let me let you in on a little secret, and some of you can testify to this. Some of those things can change quite a bit, right? Those those things that you used to be skilled at and the talents you had, especially your athletic abilities, tend to diminish over time, right? And, and let me tell you, uh, I think about some homecoming games back in, uh, in uh, Dutchtown uh, area, Prairieville, where we came from, uh, big rivalries. You have them everywhere, I'm sure, but I, I think specifically of a game that was held there, and, and those people would tailgate like a, a major college game, like for you know, days leading up to the rivalry game, and you see a lot of the, these, these men, these 30-year-old men, 40-year-old men, walk, walking around wearing their high school jerseys and letterman jackets. That's sad. That, that's sad that, 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 that the pinnacle of your life, the best days of your life were when you were 17 or 18 years old, that you look back and that was it. That was your highlight where you scored a touchdown or, or you hit the winning uh, 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 basket or whatever it is. And so your, that, your identity is attached to these things. You know, you know, who are you going to be when those skills and those talents are gone? You understand what I'm saying? That cannot define you. That cannot be where your identity rests. And for some of you, uh, and this really hits close home to, 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 to me, uh, is that your role as a mom or a dad is what gives you identity, right? Your, your role as a, as a parent gives you identity. The, the blessing of being a parent is something that not everyone has the privilege of being, and we know that, that and we never stop being parents, amen? Grandparents, great-grandparents, we never stop being parents. There's always a, a measure of parenting that goes on there, but our roles as parents change over time, or they should. They should. It, it, it should shift and, and change. And, and many empty nesters, uh, 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 parents really struggle after their children move on, out on their own and start their own lives. Why? Because they, they've been so connected with being mom, so connected with being dead, that, that, that their lives uh, uh, were, were so wrapped around uh, their, their children for those 18 or 20 years that they had them. You know, it'd say, well, who are you uh, when you, you're no longer a slave to your children's endless list of events and activities? 
Who are you when there's no more ball games? Who are you when there's no more practices? Who are, you, who are you when there's no more concerts and there's no more field trips, no more plays, right? None of those things to go to, right? Who are you after all that stuff ends? And some couples have to rebuild their marriages because they lost themselves and their children. And listen, the sad reality is some marriages don't make it, right? That, that a husband and wife have actually grown apart and fallen out of love because they've been so invested in their children that they've lost the covenant of the marriage and so if you're here this morning and you're a blood-bought born-again believer in christ let me tell you something your primary identity must be found in christ and nothing else your primary identity must be found in christ and nothing else anything else is idolatry and that should make all the difference in the world and how you live out your life as everything in your life shifts and changes your identity as a christian never changes and never will it never changes and never wills. Your standing with God never changes and never wills. Let that sink in deeply this morning. Let that wash over you and bring refreshing to your soul this morning. And as a pastor and as a husband and a dad, I know the struggles in my own heart, my own life to remember who I am at times. And far above everything else in my life, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm a child of the King. That is the, the way it has to be. That has the way it has to be for me, and that's the way it has to be for you if you've trusted Christ. You see, our problem in society, and even in our churches, our own lives, even as we're trying to be the most uh, devoted Christians as we can be, our problem is that we tend to get things backwards. We find our identity in those other things I just mentioned and not in Christ. Right? Would you all agree with that? That sometimes we get it backwards, and, and those things become primary and not our identity in Christ. And that somehow or another, and sometimes what happens unintentionally, that being a Christian is just a, a small part-time uh, activity you do or an add-on in an otherwise cluttered and confused life that you live. That Christ has to be the center of it all. Let me pray for us, and we'll get to our text. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the security that we have in Christ, Father, the, not just only for our salvation, but also our standing with you, Father, that uh, in a world that has gone mad and uh, just uh, it seems it seems everything's crazy and there's so much uncertainty with our health and with our future and with our finances and just everything seems out of whack and unstable, we find stability in you. That our standing with you never changes, that our, that that. Uh, if we are in Christ, Father, that, that, that is unmovable and that is unchangeable. So let that be an encouragement to our hearts today. Where we've drifted from that, where we've let other things replace you as primary in our lives, God, let that change today. Let that be a, a cry of repentance in our hearts this day. We love you, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Our, our passage is a, is a pretty uh, well-known passage in the Gospel of John. Just a little bit of background to it. Uh, where we're at in the passage is it's, it's Sunday evening now. It's the, the third day uh, after Jesus' burial that he had made that, you know, on the third day I will rise and, and, and come back. And that's where we're at. The tomb has been found empty as the ladies had gone back to the, the tomb and, and, and found it empty. They were going there to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial, right? They were bringing the, uh, the, 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 the flowers and the, the ointment, ointment and the, the scented uh, things to prepare his body and then, then you have 10 of the 12 disciples were gathered here uh, probably in the upper room we're not sure it doesn't tell us exactly where they were but they were hunkered down right we know about hunkering down here in Louisiana when hurricane season we know about that so they were hunkered down and hiding out and and and, and laying low uh, because they were afraid <laughs> right they were afraid that there that Jesus was we, they saw what happened to him and so this might be coming for them too Ju Judas had already killed himself and Thomas was absent we're not sure where he was at and so uh, the, the disciples had just seen Jesus crucified they saw him pierced with a spear and then they saw him placed in a sealed tomb to them in their minds there's no doubt that he was dead right absolutely dead graveyard dead and so their minds had to be racing with questions you know are we next are we next? Are they coming for us? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is that what happened here? Are, are the women to be trusted? They come back. Are, or can we believe their story? Or are they hysterical with grief? Or, 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 you know, where's the body? They had to be asking all these questions. So all these things were going through their minds that everything that they had placed their faith in, everything they had built their identity on was up in, uh, was a question mark now. It was, it was shaky at best and outright lie at worst. So had they been suckered, Right? Had they been suckered, had they been lured into following yet another false prophet, then all their questions and doubts were answered. 
All their questions and doubts were answered. Their identity in Christ was secure, and so will yours be, and so can yours be if you have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ. So go ahead and, and, and grab your Bibles and, and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said, said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, uh, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This is a fascinating passage uh, because it shows us uh, three distinct ways that the gospel shapes our identity is what what we'll see here this morning. And it also gives us a a clear view of, of all three members of the Godhead, right? That, that as believe, uh, Baptists, uh, uh, we believe in the, in the doctrine of the Trinity where you have uh, the Godhead. The, the Bible teaches and clearly portrays, as our passage shows us, a uh, Trinitarian view of God. Uh, and what I say there is, when I say the Trinity, it's, it's a one God, right? Not multiple gods. One God existing simultaneously in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And that's what we're talking about here today. So we'll see all three play an active role in our new identity in Christ. And the first and most important way the gospel shapes our identity is that we have peace with God, we've made peace with God the Father there, verses 19 to 20. And without this peace, nothing else matters, right? If we don't have peace with God, then really we have nothing to talk about further than that. And, and so that's what we see there in 19 and 20. It says, then the same day at evening of being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the, in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. See, the disciples had locked themselves away because they were afraid that they would be gathered up next. And, and what the, the, they were thinking was the Jews were going to put an end of all this Jesus stuff. They were going you know, to squash this cult that had, had arisen and put an end to it all. But then Jesus simply appears in their midst and says, peace be to you. Peace be to you, right? That's the Hebrew word shalom. The the, the peace of God is what what you're saying there. And and certainly it had to frighten them. Can can you imagine uh, any one of us, if if suddenly someone that you love, somebody who passed away, would suddenly appear here in the middle of this middle aisle and say, you know, would that that not frighten you? Just, Just all of a sudden appear. That's what they experienced. And so certainly there was a sense of that, that kind of a, a frightening moment that a, a ghost or a spirit that would, had suddenly appeared to them. But Jesus, he had, this, he had this glorified, a physical body, and yet he could pass through walls. We don't know if he like, just walked through the walls or, or, or did he just materialize. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. It just says that he appears. And so we see there that he showed them the scars on his hands and, the, and his side, and, and he comforted them that he was truly alive. You see, that that matters. All this matters that that Jesus had to be uh, uh, resurrected. Jesus, if Jesus did not bodily resurrect from the dead, then we all would be dead in our sins and would have no hope of redemption. Man, this is so important. This is so important. This is is the other part of Easter where, yes, Jesus died for our sins and and he hung on the cross and he was placed in the grave, but he had to be raised from the dead. If he wasn't resurrected, then guess what? Our sins were not atoned for, and we are still all still dead in our sins and trespasses. And so this is great news. See, Jesus' announcement of peace was to calm their fears, but it was also a declaration of their right standing with God. Until Jesus rose from the grave, the transaction of our atonement was incomplete. That Jesus' resurrection was proof that God's wrath against our sins had been satisfied. That's what it was. It was proof. It was evidence. See, our sins, the Bible says, has made us enemies of God. That sin is committing treason against the king when you think about that. That's what it is. It's, it's the, the, the king of kings, the lord of lords. It's, it's committing treason. And in, in wartime, you think about for us, you get shot, right? That we're not going to have a, there's not going to be a tribunal. We're not going to have any discussion. There's not going to be any plea bargaining. You commit treason against the king. You commit treason against the president. Guess what? Death sentence. And that's what sin is. And when we do that, when we commit sin, that's exactly 
what happens with us in the very same way. The punishment for our guilt was both physical death and eternal condemnation in hell. That's what Romans 3.23 talks about, that we have all committed this. We're all guilty of sin without exception. See, this punishment that we face uh, it, it is irreversible on our part. There's nothing that we could do to fix it. There's nothing that we could do to reconcile ourselves. There's nothing that we could do to make ourselves. It says we're dead in our sins and our trespasses. You know what dead people do? Nothing, because they're dead. That's our standing. We could do nothing to save ourselves. Only God could do something about our hopeless condition. That's the whole point of Jesus' incarnation, that, that God would robe himself in humanity and human flesh and dwell amongst men. That Jesus would bear our sin and he would bear, we would bear his righteousness. That great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right? That's what the scripture says. Humanity did not need a good example to live by. Humanity needed a savior. Right? That's what we needed. That's why we needed to accomplish peace. Jesus took all of the wrath that was due you and me, and we received his perfect righteousness. See, it is only by the grace of God in sending his one and only son to atone for our sins that we can have peace with God. There is no other way. There is no other way, regardless of what people want to say, regardless of what people think that you can earn your way or you can choose your own path or, or, or Buddha's way or Islam's way or, or, or Jehovah's Witness way or Mormon's way. Wrong, 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 and wrong. There's only one way, and that's faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. There aren't many ways, only one way. And you can't earn it. You can't work your way there. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All right? You can't earn your way. It's just simply God's gift, God's grace. Listen, if your identity is in Christ through repentance and faith, you have peace with God the Father right now. You have it. You have it. You have peace with God right now. It's not something that you'll receive later or maybe if you measure up or if you hold the line and you live a good life and then you'll stand before him on judgment day and he's going to open the books and, and, and count your points up and see uh, uh, how many times you came to Sunday school, how much money you gave to the church, all those things. Then he's going to make a decision. No, no, no. If you've repented of your sin, you place your faith in Christ, you have peace with God right now. It'll never change. It will never change. And if you're not a Christian today, this peace is available to you also. The Bible says, whosoever will, whosoever will. And you're in this place today, hearing the gospel today, you're a whosoever will. You're a candidate to receive this peace. Repent of your sin. Turn from what God calls evil. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, believing that he is God, believing that his work on the cross was sufficient to save you. Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? You see that? You will be saved. Not maybe. It's an emphatic statement. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Listen, today is the day. Make a decision. Make a decision for Christ today and make it public during our time of invitation. Listen, don't keep putting it off. Don't pe- keep putting it off. Don't, don't keep delaying this. Don't keep on pondering this. That today is the day of salvation. And listen, I don't, I don't scare you. I, I don't say this to scare you, but today could be your last opportunity. Today could be your last opportunity. Brothers and sisters, your identity in Christ has given you peace with God the Father. The second way the gospel shapes our identity is that we have been sent by God the Son. So we've, we've received peace with God the Father, now we have been sent by God the Son. In verse 21 it says, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And so what we have here is Jesus directly telling the disciples to go tell others how they can be saved and receive the peace of God. That's exactly what he's saying here. That's what he's referring to, that, that, that God the Father had sent God the Son to seek and to save fallen humanity. You see, the whole thing about Jesus' life, you think about uh, his incarnation as a child and growing up, really all we know is like three years of his public ministry. All of his public ministry was to offer peace to sinners. That's what he was always about. 
That was it. Everything we have recorded in our Gospels is about offering peace and calling people to repent of their sins. And that's what every Christian is called to do as well. That's what I'm called to do. That's what you're called to do. The very same thing. You say, what would Jesus do? He would offer the peace of God. He offers the Gospel. He offers redemption. That Mark's Gospel shows us this sense of urgency. If you read the Gospel of Mark, it's, it's the shortest one of all. So it's a, you know, if you want to say, I want to read the Gospel, start there. So a lot of people point to the Gospel of John, and that's great too. But if you say, I'm not a big reader, start in the Gospel of Mark. It's small, and over and over again, you, you, you see these words like suddenly, right? Or immediately, over and over again, you, 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 pick, you feel this sense of urgency that Jesus had, this focus that Jesus had towards the ministry of reconciliation. You see in, 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 in uh, the Gospel of Mark there in, in chapter 1, see, after John the Baptist was, had baptized Jesus, that Jesus got busy. He got to work. He got to busy preaching the gospel. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says, uh, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Right? You want to say, what, what am I supposed to tell people? What, what is my message? What is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of Occupy Number 2 Baptist Church? That's it. We are to call people to repent and believe in the gospel. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. That Jesus w- was sharing the gospel with all kinds of people as we, as we, as we read our, our, the gospel accounts. All kinds of sinners. And guess what? We are too. Listen to this. I want you to get the, 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 the scope of this. Our, the scope of our mission field. That we, we tend to want to pick and choose who we'll share with and who we won't. Listen. We're to, we're to share the gospel with all kinds of sinners. Religious sinners. Sexually immoral sinners. Blind sinners. Deaf sinners. Crippled sinners criminal sinners, working class sinners, white collar sinners, drunk sinners, drug addict sinners, stay at home mom sinners, good old boy sinners, black sinners, white sinners, Hispanic sinners, Asian sinners, rich sinners, poor sinners, Republican sinners, and Democratic sinners. And I can go on and on and on. Do you get my point? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Do you, do you, you see what I'm saying here? Is that clear enough? Who did I leave out? Lots of people. But my point is all people. Sinners need this message, and we have it. We do not get to pick and choose who deserves the gospel and who does not. Listen, none of us deserve to hear the gospel. Did you know that? What, what, what made you so special? What makes you think that you deserve to hear the gospel? Let me tell you why you, you wonder why you heard the gospel, because God's grace was on your life. And, and, and for us, especially here in the Bible Belt, there's no shortage of churches. And the likelihood of you hearing the gospel was that, that you were born into a family that brought you to church, and that's how you heard the gospel. But not everybody is that fortunate. And for those people, we have to go to them. We have to reach them with the gospel. None of us deserve God's grace. That's why it's called grace, because you can't earn it. See, I find it kind of shocking when I read this to me to, to hear Jesus having to tell the, the disciples this, to go and tell everyone about the peace of God. Right? He, he, he didn't want them to just sit around being religious. Does that sound familiar? Right? I don't want y'all, because if, if he's like, he's almost saying that y'all waited, I told you to wait on me, and here I am, and now you're being commissioned, I'm, tell, I'm sending you. The, the Father sent me, I'm sending you, because otherwise what you might do is just sit around and be religious. Just sit around and sing songs. Just sit around and study the Bible all day long. Right? And, and do crafts and eat food together. He, if, he, if he didn't say to go, if, I'm not, if I don't send you, then you won't go anywhere. You'll just sit there and be religious. Does that sound familiar? Jesus was pushing his people to go and share the gospel. As your pastor, I am encouraging you. I am impressing upon you. I am sending you, go and share the gospel. This is not the end. This is not the end of Christianity. The goal is not to just sit here, sing songs, listen to a guy talk, study your Bible and pray and then go home and then do it again next week. We have a mission. The Father sent Jesus. The Son has sent us. And I send you as well. Now hear me. Nothing is more important. Nothing is more important in life than worshiping Jesus and telling people about Jesus. Share the gospel. Extend the offer of peace with God. Be an evangelist. See, the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended back to the right hand of the Father in heaven was to tell the world about him. We know it as the Great Commission. I even backed up a couple of verses to give a little more scope of what we see here in Matthew 28 to verse 16. 16 through 20, it says, Then the eleven disciples uh, went away into Galilee to, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Wow, what a sentence there. That, that, that it says that they worshipped him, but some doubted. And he, and he still gets referring to poor old uh, Thomas there. 
And in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. If you have been saved by the gospel, Jesus has commissioned you to share the gospel with others to make disciples of all the nations. All right? Is that clear? All of us. It's all of our responsibility. If you receive the gospel, you're called to share the gospel. Living sent is, is, a, is a buzzword I remember when I was in seminary, to, to live sent. I think there's even a, name, a title of a book that living sent means you live all of your life with the mindset of a missionary. That to, to, to be the salt and light wherever you go, loving and serving, telling everyone about Jesus and how they can have peace with God also. That's who we are. Brothers and sisters, your identity in Christ means that you have been sent by God the Son with the gospel of peace. And the final way that the gospel shapes our identity is that we have been filled by God the Spirit. Filled by God the Spirit. That, that in verses 22 and 23 It says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You see, Jesus was speaking here prophetically of the coming of the Holy Spirit that would fall on them on the day of Pentecost. That's what he's doing. Because it wasn't here. They did not receive the Spirit. We know that because if you continue reading the Bible and you read in Acts, that's when the Holy Spirit actually fell. It was speaking prophetically. It wasn't that his, his actual breath, his breath that came out of his mouth, filled them with the Holy Spirit. It was a reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit. That they were believers already because they had uh, repented of their sins and had placed their faith in Jesus. But they were between the covenants. That's what this is a strange time. This is a, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a transitional period uh, where, where these men existed. And that God the Holy Spirit would come and dwell within every Christian from the day of Pentecost uh, forward. Right, And that, was, that changed everything. And so uh, every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are a believer in Christ, if you trusted him... Right now, guess what? You are filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, well, I don't, feel, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't really feel like anything. Holy Spirit's not a feeling. It's a promise. It's a promise. It's just like you're standing with God is a promise. that The, the Word of God says you are filled. The, the Holy Spirit, listen, if the Holy Spirit is not in you, then guess what? You're lost. You are lost. The Holy Spirit dwells every believer. Because every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit, every Christian has everything they need to accomplish their mission and live a life that honors and glorifies God. You can never say that I'm just, I just don't feel capable of doing this. What, I read the Bible and I see all these things in here. I just feel overwhelmed. I just don't feel like I, can do, I can't do all these things. I can't live up to what God would call me to do. And that's just foolishness. That's the enemy talking. The, the Spirit of God indwells you. If God tells you to do something, calls you to do something, guess what? I promise you, you can do it. You can absolutely do it, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. See, nearly every example that we find in the New Testament writings that mentions uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's also accompanied with an example of, of one of the disciples or someone being bold to witness for Christ. That's what you see almost every time that they open their mouths. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with boldness. That's what we see over and over again. That we don't have to to figure it out. We don't have to muster up the power to share the gospel. We already have it inside of us. All we have to do is open our mouths and unleash it. Be available. Be available and be intentional is what we must do. It's always here. The only thing that's holding you back from being a spirit-filled gospel witness is you. It's you. The only, only one, the only thing holding you back from being effective, an effective witness of the gospel is you. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness to witness for Christ. And listen, this boldness, if you're not sure about it, this boldness that you seek, it's only a prayer away. It's only a prayer away that we pray for lots of things, lots of bobos, lots of hurts, lots of situations. How often do you pray for the boldness to witness for Christ? How often do you you ask the Holy Spirit to empower me, embolden me as I go to work, as I visit my family, as as I go to my school, whatever the situation is, fill me with your spirit. Give me the boldness to stand up for the gospel today. Give me the boldness to reach out to that person that I've been ashamed or afraid to, to, to speak with because they might reject me. It's only a prayer away. That we have also, according to this verse, that we have no authority of our own, but when we speak the word of God, we can speak with God's authority. See, the Holy Spirit will affirm these things in us. 
You look at verse 23, it's kind of an interesting verse, a peculiar verse, and it seems to imply us reading at face value that uh, the apostles had the power to forgive sins and withhold forgiveness, right? That's what it says there. But we, we know you have to, that's when you have to put things in context. And, and, and when well, the, the Bible tells us that only God can forgive sins, right? We know that. that that's one of the charges that, that they, they brought against Jesus. When Jesus began to forgive people's sins, that's, that was the charge brought against him because they didn't believe he was God. He said, because only God can forgive sins. And so surely that's not what, what Jesus was implying here. What Jesus is saying is that Christians have the authority to, to declare who is forgiven and who is not forgiven based off of their response to the gospel. That's what he's talking about here. We can make a clear declaration based off of how they respond to the gospel. You share the gospel, the person rejects the gospel, guess what? Their sins are not forgiven, right? That, that's not me saying that. That's the word of God saying that. If, if you share the gospel and the person repents of their sin and receives the gospel, guess what? Their sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what, what he's saying uh, in this passage here. And John MacArthur explains it like this. He says, when people reject the saving message of the gospel, denying the person and work of Jesus Christ, the church has divine authority based on the revealed word of God to tell them that they will perish in hell unless they repent. Conversely, when people profess faith in Christ as their Savior and Lord, the church can affirm that profession if it is genuine with equal confidence. See, that's what Jesus is speaking of here. That's what he's talking about. It's simply a mind-blowing to know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within every Christian. When I think about the, the, that God dwells in me, it just kind of I just can't even imagine that. It's hard to get over that. That, that the, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, leading us, and guiding us, comforting us, encouraging us, strengthening us, convicting of us of, of our sin, teaching us the Word of God, and on and on I can go that His roles are limitless. And notice I said His roles, not it. Holy Spirit is a He, it's a person. Right? Brothers and sisters, your identity in Christ means that you have been filled by God the Spirit. And so as we close our time this morning, you see, until we fully embrace who we are in Christ, we will continue to struggle with an identity crisis. Right? And until you fully embrace who you are in Christ, until you fully embrace this, you're going to continue to bounce from, I'm a mom, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a, I'm a husband, I, I work here, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, on and on, everything in the world but resting in your identity in Christ. That God is not satisfied with just being a part of your life. God is not interested in playing a backup role in your life. If you are a Christian, you have an entirely new identity in Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. Paul described it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Right? So we've learned this morning, if you are in Christ, you have made peace with God the Father, that there is now no more condemnation for you, that, you that, that that enmity between you has been done away with. You have peace with God. You've been reconciled with God. You've also been sent by God the Son that we're all missionaries of the gospel, every single one of us. We, nobody can say it's not me. That's not my job. You're, you're wrong. You're sadly mistaken that we are all called to share the gospel, to live sent, to, to live as missionaries. And that we've also all been filled by God the Spirit, that the, the, the empowerment and to accomplish uh, all that, that God would have us to do. So I implore you this morning, I would plead with you this morning, embrace your new identity in Christ. Embrace your new identity in Christ. And for those here this morning, my unbelieving friends, our, our guest here this morning, it's time for you to respond to the gospel, right? I, I shared it earlier and I told you exactly what was needed for you your response to repent of your sin, to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And so in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation time. That's whenever you make your, your decision public. Right? That you must make it a, a, a public uh, decision uh, for Christ. If you decided to surrender your heart and life to Jesus, it's time to make it public this morning. Don't delay. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, to you about today, if you're one that's wrestling with your identity, if you're kind of all over the place, you seem just kind of schizophrenic with, you know, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Christian on Sunday morning and I go to work and I, I take off my Christian hat and I, I live a different way, way there, I live a different way at school or wherever. I'm, I'm this way around this group of friends, I'm this way around church people and all that. Repent of that today. Today would be a great day to say, no more, God, I, 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 I repent of this. I'm turning from this. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of being a double agent. Is a, is a good way of looking at it. I'm, I'm tired of being one way here and one way another there. Help me to rest. Help me to fully embrace my identity in Christ today. Whatever the Lord 
has imparted on your heart this morning. Let's uh, have a moment uh, of prayer, and then we'll respond as the Lord is leading you. Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, what an awesome passage. What an awesome passage, Father. I, I can't even, uh, I try to put my mind, uh, put myself there in that situation as, as to be sitting there in that room and, and to see uh, I'm just heartbroken and, and weeping and, and in despair, not sure what, what's going to happen next. And it, it, is my whole life a, a, a lie, everything I believed in? Is it all been a joke and, and just a cruel, cruel joke? And, and then suddenly, there Jesus is. There Jesus is standing in our midst and says, peace be with you. Right, that everything that he said, everything that he spoke of before he went to the cross was true. Every bit of it, he's alive. And because he's alive, we have peace with him, Father. That you have made peace available. That we have been reconciled through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I pray that this morning, my hope that everyone in this room today, everyone within the hearing of my voice would have received this grace that would have uh, made peace with you through faith in Christ. But Lord, I know that's just wishful thinking. Father, I know there are many that are even here sitting in these pews today that have not made this decision, have not trusted the gospel, have, do not have peace with you. Father, I pray that you would prick their hearts this morning. Father, I pray that, that you would stir up something in them that helped them to realize that maybe they've been playing games, maybe they've been playing church, maybe they've been putting on an act, Lord, but that in of their act, that phoniness, that just being religious, that road leads to hell. That road leads to condemnation. So, Father, I pray that today that you would open their eyes to the reality of their lostness. Give them the courage to respond to you in repentance and faith. Lord, for your church, for your saints, your people, your children, God, I pray that we would rest in our identity in Christ, that we would fully embrace it, that we would stop bouncing around and seeking identity in other things, seeking identity in relationships, seeking identity in skills, seeking identity in, in careers, seeking identities in, in, in all number of things, Father, that help us to say, first and foremost, I am a Christian. My identity rests fully in Christ. Everything else follows after that. Father, have your way now. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.